Welcome back to Panda Pen Club. Today I'd like to review the Jin Hao 8802 which I have here in its mother of pearl nacreish mutation. Jin Hao make multiple robustly themed variants of this model and they offer the same treatment across multiple models including the 650 and the 950. These include the porcelain version featuring anything from a single rose to full-blown humbling scenery and the wood version or possibly fake wood. I haven't examined these up close, but it comes in various stains or hues or possibly species. And then you have the standard conservative zipped up version. And then we have what we have here, shell based versions of this pen. The shell versions themselves come in multiple subcategories of design, including elongated strips of shell or the kind of distorted checkerboard of shells that we have here today. Goulet, which is one place you should look if you're looking to buy this pen, although I warn you, you will be paying slightly over the odds in my view, offer this version of the pen and they describe it as a way to get the Raden look without paying the Raden price. Raden or Lo Dien is a style of Japanese lacquerware that involves boiling thick mollusk shells for up to a week and then peeling off the malleable interior remnants, which you then cut. Particularly notable shells for this purpose include abalone or the green turban shell or the horned turban shell. The attractive dregs of these marvelous creatures are then adhered to whatever you've lacquered. More lacquer is added. And then it's polished intensely. So you get a smooth surface as you do here, an inlaid effect. So why would you want to get the Raden look without the Raden price? First impressions of this pen are indeed very positive. You get all the iridescent swirls and pretty hues from the shell. It's perfectly smooth. It's arranged in alternating dark and white shell, which give us the checkerboard. And they also give us the impression and warranty of intentional design, thus exacerbating the sensation of cachet that you might get with this pen. The shell part of this pen exclusively inhabits the shaft with the cap and lower finial being in black lacquer. The remaining parts of this pen, the lower finial band, the cap band and the clip, as well as the upper finial are in chromed metal. The upper finial is this outward extending chrome hat look. And when one reaches the top, you'll encounter a little moat. And when you've leapt over the moat, you'll find yourself plummeting downwards, downwards, downwards into this black pupil at the top of the pen. And after you've dropped through the cap, noticing the plastic inner cap appreciatively on your way down, you'll drop through the shaft, noting perhaps that the base metal for this pen is brass or perhaps brass. Then you'll emerge from the also lower black, lower finial, noting that the lower finial is nice and solid, weighted to balance the pen correctly. Then there's another cap band which divides the lower finial from the shaft and faced with the prospect of stepping up and then sliding across the slippery surface of the shell to make your way up to examine the clip, you might abandon this ridiculous project and zoom out and look at the pen like a normal person. You'll notice that the clip is the same design as you get with the Jinhao 159. Now I've mentioned in my review of the Jinhao 159 that I find the clip on this model, well rather, rather, rather gopping really, so much so that I've actually gone so far as to pull it off some of the Jinhao 159s I have, and I have to say, I think it looks better for it. But I won't be doing that with this pen. I think for some reason, for whatever mad reason, I won't be doing that with this pen because for some reason I like the clip on this model. Perhaps it's because of the proportions of the pen. It's quite a nice size. It's 136 millimeters long, capped as you see it now, and 39 grams. Uncapped, it's 126 millimeters long and 26 grams. Visually, it looks nice. It looks like it costs more than it did. I've seen it on Amazon for $13.95 and AliExpress for $7.83. Apart from the perhaps tinny clip, everything feels tight and well-made. The cap in particular has one of the most sterling 
and ship shape little click sounds I have ever heard in my life. And this impression of care and quality is carried through to the inset shell, which historically was an act of, of craftsmanship that created a covetable item. According to the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, the technique of lacquering with inlays was almost certainly developed in China and then imported to Japan during the Tang Dynasty. These imports most likely came in the form of diplomatic gifts. And there are records of lacquer work, particularly shell inlays on lacquer work, in the form of tributes and tithes and gifts and bribes swirling around Southeast Asia and beyond since, well, throughout history really. The BBC and the British Museum did a fantastic radio collaboration called The History of the World in 100 Objects, and Object 34 was a cup a lacquer work cup with inlays that was most likely given as a gift during the fourth century. And I'll put a link to where you can listen to that radio program in the description for this video. The US Office of Protocol records the presence of Nacreish Mother of Pearl in a diplomatic gift in 2016. So I'll leave you to imagine how much shell has passed hands in between those two dates. And this immediately begs the question, would the Jin Hao 8802 make a good gift? Specifically, would it make a good diplomatic gift? Now, whether you fulfill formal or informal diplomatic roles or ambassadorial duties in your life, I don't know. But there are times in all of our lives, I think, where we're called on to give gifts that are, in some sense, diplomatic. A loathed godchild, perhaps, or your boss in a secret Santa, or just a cared about acquaintance whose departure or birthday needs to be marked in just the right way. Now is this just the right pen for all those scenarios or any of those scenarios? Gifts in diplomacy are an absolute minefield. The goal of diplomatic gifts is to entwine oneself in the good graces of somebody else representing the state or some other larger cause. It's most effective if the gift is somehow special, something only you can give and only they can receive. This can, of course, go very wrong. For example, in 1983, Donald Rumsfeld gave Saddam Hussein a pair of medieval spiked torture hammers, which history perhaps suggests sent all the wrong messages. Sometimes the personal quality or specialness of a gift is prioritized to the detriment of uniqueness. For example, David Cameron in 2012 gave Barack Obama a table tennis table from the British manufacturer Dunlop, calling a past occasion on which the pair had played table tennis. Unfortunately, it was quickly discovered that the table in question was manufactured in China. Witness the bugled vexation of the British tabloids to get some idea of the diplomatic minefield that is gift giving rife with unintended consequences. Francois Hollande, in 2013, he was presented with a camel by the government of Mali. Francois Hollande, at the best of times, seemed capable of generating a hapless quality. Not sure what to do with it. He temporarily left it with a family in Timbuktu who, due to a misunderstanding, had the animal slaughtered and ate it in a tagine. Animals are tricky. A pet's not just for Christmas, after all. The Chinese have a particular ace up their sleeve in this regard with panda diplomacy. The pair of pandas they presented to Nixon after his visit to China in 1972 represented an enduring reminder of potentially positive connection. A spectacular and lasting gesture that only China could possibly give a unique gift. The alligator, given to John Quincy Adams by General Lafayette, may be less so. Apparently, insanely, Adams kept this alligator in a bathroom of the White House. Without wishing to completely skewer the French, but one of their presidents does offer another excellent example of unintended consequences in gift giving, known as l'affaire des diamants, which sounds like a Tintin novel. In 1973, future president Giscard accepted a gift of two diamonds from notorious dictator Bokassa I of the Central African Republic. In 1979, now the president of France, this was revealed in the tabloids, and in 1981, Giscard lost the election, and this affair was said to have contributed hugely to his election loss. They need to be not too expensive as to be improper, but not too cheap as to be insulting. Secret Santa, international diplomacy, they maybe are not so dissimilar. Injecting a dash of humour can sometimes help 
slip by a parsimonious or rather cheap present. A good example of this, successful example of this, would be the crocodile insurance given to Barack Obama on his visit to Australia. A less successful example of this would be John Kerry's gift of two potatoes to Sergei Lavrov in 2014. As with all gifts, the key is thoughtfulness. This is fine if you're dealing with heads of state or even tiny little future heads of state, but what if you're doling out favours to Colonel so-and-so or Mr. blah 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 from the consulate? You might find yourself skirting around ambiguously, sometimes even dangerously. Gift or bribe, tribute or token, and it might bite you back, or your recipient, or their guests. In that sense, the inlaid lacquer work of the Jin Hao is actually perfect. Perfect. It represents an old trade craft converted into a scaled production item representing modernity and progress. And yet, because no patch of real shell is in fact the same, it is technically at least unique. A unique artifact at a reasonable cost. Well done, Jin Hao. Perhaps you've solved a lot of problems, but wait. One more thing. Before you dial a dozen for your next diplomatic undertaking, we have one more matter to attend to. The writing sample. I'm writing on Claire Fontaine. That's right, Claire Fontaine paper. And I'm writing with rather interestingly bloody Brexit ink, which is a limited edition ink from Dear Min. And all I can say is my sentiments exactly. It's not exactly a diplomatic event, Brexit, but it's certainly one that could do with a few restorative gifts being flung back and forth, and I suspect there will be in the future. It's a red shimmer or shade in the blue here. So red, white, and blue. We have the Union Jack. For about 20 pounds, you get 80 millimeters. So it's not bad for a limited edition ink, but it's selling out fast. So I'd recommend checking it out pretty soon. Back to the Jin Hao, which writes smoothly, readily. There's adequate ink flow. No skipping or hard starting that I've noticed. There's a tiny bit of flex if you wanna go there. Although as ever, there's a risk factor. Lucky Panda. Six. Jinxed. Zebra. Four. Quick. Game. Of. Whist. The threads are metal on metal, adding to the sensation of quality. Also, is the section which has a nice grip to it. I don't know precisely what substance it's made of, but I like this grippiness it has. And the last thing to mention is it's easy to clean and flush. If you'd like to give a gift, or if you'd like to look like you've been given a gift, or if you have no Machiavellian intentions whatsoever and would simply appreciate a really solid, pretty fountain pen in your life, then this may well be the pen for you. If you enjoyed this review, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to Panda Pen Club on YouTube. And when you click subscribe, please also click the bell button. It really helps us. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. On the chuckability scale, how willing am I to chuck this into my backpack without worrying about it? Five being I take all the pleasure in the world in doing so, and zero being I'm absolutely beside myself, possibly near tears. This pen gets a perhaps rather unsatisfying three. It would probably survive, but I don't like the idea of it.